love us, you train us, you correct us. And we're gonna see this morning in the text that you discipline us. But Lord, at the heart of that discipline, at the heart of that correction, at the heart of that training, at the heart of that education, despite the pain, it's because you love us and you are a good father. You are a perfect heavenly father. So Lord, thank you for your goodness. And we praise you in the mighty name of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, be exalted in this place. Be exalted in every person's mind. Be exalted in everyone's heart. Be exalted in our presence. Holy Spirit, draw us and point us to the Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. How's everybody doing this morning? Y'all ready for Christmas? As the old saying goes, if you're not ready, ready or not, here it comes. <laughs> and uh, But let's, let's not forget to... Uh, lose sight of the true meaning of Christmas. You know, I love this time of the year. I love celebrating the birth of my Lord and Savior. I love getting together with family and loved ones and, and uh, love eating and just enjoying the season. So let's, let's keep that in mind. As, as we go out to the business of the days and the shopping, let's, um, let's enjoy Christ Jesus. Amen? That's, that's what this season's all about, bringing us back to the heart of our, of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. Please turn in your Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to teach verse by verse Hebrews chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. But I want to open up with the first couple of verses. So kind of get your, uh, your minds going in the right direction to see where we're going this morning with the teaching. So let's take a look at it. Hebrews chapter 4, excuse me, chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. The word of the Lord says, You have not resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. A quote from the Old Testament. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Lord, thank you for your word. As we dive into it now, Father, let us uh, mine it. Let us look for the treasures and let us mine the biblical truths that's in every verse. And Father, let it enrich our hearts at this time of the year, um, at Christmas season, as we love you, remember you, trust in you, and live knowing that because of your perfect love, you do indeed discipline us. In Jesus' name I pray, Father. Amen. Amen. The title of my message this morning is The Discipline of the Lord. The Discipline of the Lord. That's the, that's, the, that's the theme. That's the thing I want you to go home today thinking about is what does the discipline of the Lord look, back, look like? I posted on Facebook this week. I, put, I posed a question out there. I put a question on Facebook and I said, uh, I says, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word discipline? And I went back and I looked at it yesterday, and I either had 96 or 97 responses. I was like, wow, but let's take a look at a couple of them. Or not a couple of them, at all of them. Some of them had multiple, um, multiple people said the same thing. But those are all the Facebook responses to my Facebook post. You can go on my Facebook post and look at it. If you're not Facebook friends with me, Facebook friend request me, and then you can go look at the post. But boundaries, self-control, necessary, focused, Hitting the baseball. Um, I like what Dina said. Dina said uh, there at the very end, um, doing what needs to be done for the the best outcome. There was another one too. Oh, Planet Fitness. I thought that was pretty funny. Over here on the left-hand column, somebody put a butt whooping. And I can can, can go with that one. That is so true. But those were the responses. The number one response, uh, eight people out of 97 responded with correction. So that was the number one uh, definition of discipline. Love and training were tied for number two. They both, two people, uh, excuse me, uh, love and training were tied, and they had six votes or six people commented that. So, so you see the theme. I think most people get it. Uh, it's a combination of correction, 
love, and training. But again, you know, just uh, some, some uh, the ones I thought were funny were, was, a, was a butt whooping and uh, Planet Fitness. I remember the year 1984. In my heathen days, I got caught with drugs at school. And uh, 1984, I was at Swansea, and I went to Mr. Maddox's office, and he expelled me from school. And that was a very painful, that was a very painful process. But what was even more painful was when I got home that afternoon, my mom found out, and my mom said, your father will be home in one hour. And I was like, oh. You know, that shriek of fear. And, and then, and so I go to the bedroom, I put six pair of underwear on, trying, trying to pad the rear, you know, trying to figure out a way of what I'm going to do. And then my dad walks in the door, and he says, to the room. <laughs> that was rough. And he took me into the room, and we went into the board of education. And he corrected me. But guess what happened after that correction? I never did that again. I never, I never took drugs to school again. But discipline comes in all forms. But at the heart of my father's correction, and I know this because I know my mom and my dad, at the heart of my father's correction, at the heart of that butt whooping was his love. He loved his son. He did not like seeing his son make mistakes. So discipline comes in all forms. And, uh, and, and, and it, the word discipline, we're going to talk about the Greek word and the meaning of it. But it comes in all forms, and there's a, there's a lot of different angles we can look at it. But y'all ready to look at it this morning in the text? All right, let's do it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4 says, You have not resisted to the point of shedding blood, and you're striving against sin. Verse 4. I asked you this morning, in your fight against temptation of the flesh, have you fought to the point of shedding blood? I have not. Have you? You see, the Apostle Paul viewed the Christian life as an enduring race, as a fight, as a, I'm going after the Lord Jesus Christ with all my heart, and nothing is standing in the way. Come hell or high water, come whatever may, I am going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, and I am going to crucify this flesh, and I am going to serve him with all of my heart. God is, as the song we sing, God is so good, and he is. He's a perfect, loving, good, heavenly father. And he's given us many tools in our fight against the flesh. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us the word of God. He's given us fellowship. Men, God has given you to me and me to you and ladies to ladies. He's given us all these beautiful and awesome tools to help us fight this good fight. And this morning, on top of the Holy, giving us the Holy Spirit, on top of giving us the Word of God, on top of giving us fellowship and all the other gifts he's given us to minister in the body, now we're going to look at one that's really not taught a whole lot about in the church, but is real, and that is the discipline, the discipline of the Lord. But So verse 5, let's take a look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. The first thing that the author of Hebrews is going to here in verse 5 is he establishes this, number one, the importance. The importance of discipline. How important it is in the Christian life to experience God's discipline. What, what is discipline? The Greek word is pedia. If you look it up on Blue Letter Bible, it says uh, the word discipline, pedia, it means to train, to educate, to correct. So, a little addendum to my little illustration a while ago. Discipline is more than correction, family. Discipline is more than correction. It's training. It's education. Think about a good, strong parent or a good ball coach. You know, they're focused. They're in the zone. They expect things to be done a certain way. I'm going to talk about, at the, at the close of my message, I'm going to give you an illustration from Dixie Youth Baseball on the difference between good discipline 
versus, versus bad discipline. But it means to train, to educate, to correct. And he says there in verse 5, two things that grabbed my attention in verse 5. One, he says, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. In other words, do not forget. Do not forget. Do not lose sight of how important the Lord's discipline is, the Lord disciplining you and you experiencing the Lord's discipline in your life. It's very important because, because it sharpens us. It sharpens us and makes us better followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. God loves you so much. Hear me out. God loves you so much, he will not allow you as a believer to stay in a place of sin. And for that reason and that reason alone, thank you, God, for discipline. Thank you for your discipline. That in my ignorance, in my moral failures, when the world gives up on me, God, you do not. That's the discipline of the Lord. That's what makes it so important that we don't forget it and we don't lose sight. You know, God's discipline keeps us straight. It keeps us on the straight and narrow. It keeps us on the straight and narrow. And most importantly, the, one of the, I'm probably going to say this a lot, but most importantly, number one, one of the many great reasons for discipline is this. It conforms you into the image of Christ. It conforms you into the image of a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ with an authentic faith, with a real faith, a faith that says, Lord, you are number one, and I want to serve you. That's what happens when you experience the Lord's discipline. I have a gut feeling by the end of this message, y'all are going to be like, oh, Lord, bring on the discipline. Bring on the discipline. Refine me. Make me a better follower of you, Lord Jesus. L ladies will be praying, Lord, help me to be an awesome wife. Uh, ladies, help me be an awesome wife to my husband. Husbands will be praying, Lord, bring on the discipline. Let me be a better and uh, better godly man for my wife. But it conforms us to the image of, the Christ, of Christ Jesus. He says there also, at the very end of verse 5, he says, don't faint. Don't faint when you are reproved by him. That's very important. That's very important for some of us who, who find this difficult. And, and who, who find this, this refining process to be difficult. When he says, don't faint when you're approved by him, what he's saying is, don't give up. Don't give up in the middle of the discipline. If the Lord is correcting you, training you, say, thank you, Lord. And understand this, God is sharpening you. God is sharpening you, and he's making you a better follower of Christ. You think you're tough now? Wait till he gets done. Wait till he gets done. Because the, the Lord, by his spirit, by his word, by fellowship, by his discipline, he refines us and he makes us strong. And that's what each and every one of us need living in an ungodly world. We need a strong faith that serves him through the good times and through the bad times. This is, again, the Lord's discipline is, number one, it is important. It is important. In other words, you got to have it. You got to have it. Let's continue. Verse 6, the next verse. This, the, this, this, this whole passage, man, it is just loaded. It is just loaded with biblical truth. Verse 6 says, For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. The, number, the second principle I present to you this morning from the text it, concerning the Lord's discipline is this. The Lord's discipline is a special love. A special love. Yes, God's discipline, his training, his education, and yes, his correction is a special love. God's love is a perfecting love. God's love says, I want the very, very best for my children. Do you want the very best for your life? If you want the very best for your life, guess what? God does too. God wants, to, God wants to perfect you, sharpen you, and make you a, a, a devout follower of him. And his love perfects us. You know, when a parent disciplines a child, it shows that they truly love. They truly love. And notice I, 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 the second half of verse 6 after it says, For those whom the Lord loves, 
It says, what, it says what? The NASB says uh, he scourges every son whom he receives. Family, that's a strong word. That's a very strong word in the text. This is not a little slap on the hand. That, that word scourging in the original language is the same word that's used to describe Jesus is beaten. It means to flog with a whip, to inflict severe pain. And trust me, I understand this well. I understand this well. I grew up under the Board of Education. I grew up, uh, I, it, I just had a thick skull. I, I was, it was hard for me to learn lessons in life. But my father would remind me. My father would remind me. 1980, 1981-ish, I was living in Casey. There was this girl in the neighborhood. I, uh, this little heathen, this little heathen sinner, I wrote her the meanest letter filled with the foulest language. And I, I did not like her. She did not like me. And I wrote her this letter, and I gave it to her to, to insult her, to hurt her. We were at odds with each other. Well, guess what she does? The next day, there's a knock on the door. And I look, out, I look at the side, and it's her giving the letter to my mom. <laughs> <sighs> Again, that evening, I learned from the Board of Education. I learned from the Board of Education. Then there was 1985-ish. I was playing with matches in the woods on Big Hickory Lane, right off of Highway 6 in Gaston. You can look it up on Google Maps. I was playing with matches in the woods, and I caught the woods on fire. And the fire department had to come and put it all out. Again, that evening, I was learning, again, <laughs> from the Board of Education. It was not, it was a scourging that, that I experienced. There's many other times. I, I could talk about catching the kitchen on fire out in Irmo, and, you know, when I left the grease for my french fries burning, and I caught the house on fire, and, and I got into a lot of trouble then. But, but sometimes discipline is painful, but deserved, but deserved, but deserved. Because we, when we see, um, when God sees his children making fatal mistakes or, or, or things that happen really bad, sometimes the punishment has to be tough. The, 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 the punishment has to be tough. But even in that tough difficult punishment that, that Harold Ford was inflicting upon me, I knew at the heart of my father's butt whooping, it was not vengeance. It was not anger. It was love. It was love. And I, I, maybe I didn't realize it in the moment, but I realize it now. I realize it now. He knew I was making decisions that was going to wreck my life. And he was trying to correct that. But anyway, but so yeah, anyway. But um, but the most important thing you need to remember when you experience the Lord, it, when you come to a place and you experience the Lord's discipline in your life, the most important thing you need to remember is this: the Lord's discipline is not punishment. Okay, hear me clearly: the Lord's discipline is not punishment, because the word punishment does not qualify as a definition for the word discipline. It, it, it's what, what the Lord's discipline is not a punishment. The Lord's discipline is a correction meant to develop your character. And God disciplines because he loves. And we may, it may be painful in the moment, but afterwards, once we learn the lesson, hopefully, that we'll realize, that we'll be like, thank you, God, Thank you, Lord, for the discipline to correct my fatal mistakes. It's a beautiful truth. But at the heart of discipline, again, it's not punishment. It's, it's correction meant to develop character, and it's the love of your heavenly Father who does it. Verse 7, verse 7, as we dive deeper here into this text, it says, It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? God, my friend, family, God deals with you as sons and daughters. 
And if you think that you can go out and live like you want and not take sin serious, you are wrong. You, you, are, you are, are wrong. God takes sin very serious. He took sin so serious that he sent his son to Calvary to forgive you. That's how, that's how it, it, salvation cost us nothing. It's a free gift. But salvation cost the father everything, which was his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You may be asking, well, what does this discipline look like? What does this discipline look like? You can turn there or you can follow up on the screen. But I think we may be given a picture of it in Psalms 32. In Psalms 32, King David has sinned greatly. He's slept with Bathsheba. He's committed adultery. And his world is a train wreck at this, at this point. In Psalms 32, what, answering the question, what does the Lord's discipline look like in our life? Psalms 32 says, uh, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. If you look there at verse 3, he says, I kept silent about my sin. That phrase means there was no, there was no repentance. There was no confession. He was, holding, he was holding it on to it. He was holding on to it in his heart. And he wasn't letting go of it. And he wasn't repenting. He says, my body wasted away. There was a physical toil that was taking place in his physical body, in his rebellion, in, in his in his. In his rebellion, but at the same time, the Lord bringing conviction and turning his heart back. There was a physical toil. And then he says, uh, the last part of verse 3, Through my groaning all day long, when you live in sin, it will torment you. When you live in rebellion as a believer, as a believer in Christ, if you live in a state of rebellion, it will torment you you. He says, he said, look what he says in verse three, through my groanings all day long, King David was miserable. He may have looked good on the outside, but on the inside, he was a train wreck. He was a train wreck because there was no repentance. There was no turning to the Lord. King David in, in this passage is suffering because of his sinful choices. And, 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 and my friend, there are painful consequences to wrong decisions in the Christian life. And God will allow you to suffer through them in order to teach you a lesson. And that lesson is um, in your misery, in your difficult, man, come back to me. Come back to me and I will restore to you the joy of your salvation if you will turn wholeheartedly back to me. That's what he wants from a, a, a believer who's fallen away. He doesn't, want to, he doesn't want to inflict punishment or wrath. Punishment and wrath were taken, were taken by Jesus at the cross, but he will allow us to experience his discipline so that in that, dis, in that moment, in that learning of, of discipline, that we will return to the Lord. He continues in verse 4. He says, For day and night... Your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. He says, your hand was heavy upon me. I feel like it was probably like this, this boulder on his shoulders, this big rock weighing him down. And that's what happens in our life as believers when we go astray, when we fall away and we continue in our rebellion. Is, is there's, a, there's a boulder there's a constant reminder, this constant guilt upon us that says, hey, return to the Lord. Confess your sins. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess it, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all sin. It's a beautiful offer. If we'll humbly bow our knee. He says, my vitality was drained away as with the heat, the fever heat of summer. You know what it's like being out there in 110 degrees and you're just... War, slap out, you're thirsty, you're tired. That's what possibly the Lord's discipline looks like in the life of a believer. But again, it's all there to drive you back to the Savior, to drive you back to his loving arms where he stands ready to receive you. So what's, and then look at verse five. Verse five, I think, is where he goes. This is where his joy 
If you read in Psalms 51, it talks about um, joy and gladness depart when we rebel. But when we repent, joy and gladness are restored. And I believe that happened in King David's life. Look at verse 5 up on the screen. It says, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And there, there it is. He, he confessed. And he, what does he say? You forgave the guilt of my sin. Again, the Lord's discipline, the Lord's love is discipline, is training, is education, is correction, and is meant to bring you back to the Father, to bring you back to the Lord. You know, if we're honest, and, I, and I'll lead the way and I'll raise my hand, if I examine my Christian life, I see times in my life where I stray to the left or I stray to the right. You know, we, we, we all have a, a propensity to stray to the left or to the right. But God in his mercy and God in his grace, God in his sovereignty, God with his, his discipline says, I will take you back. And not only will I take you back, but I will come after you. I will come after you. You know, we've heard that song, reckless love, sovereign love. His love comes after us in the form of discipline, in the form of calling you and I back to himself. Amen? Amen. Let's continue verse 8, talking about the Lord's discipline. It says, verse 8, But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. If you have experienced the Lord's discipline, shout for joy. Shout for joy and rejoice because... The Lord's discipline is evidence that you are born again. It, the Lord's discipline is evidence that you are a legitimate child of God. What does that mean? It means that your faith is real. Your faith is authentic. That, that means, uh, you know, God does not discipline those who are not his. You know, um, Irene's got um, seven sisters. There's eight Johnson girls. Imagine what Christmas Day is like. <clears throat> they all come to the house, you know, and we got, we got litters of grandchildren and some great-grandchildren. And all, they all go out in the backyard and they play. And then something will happen. You'll hear some crying. Somebody will fall. Somebody will get hurt. Somebody hit somebody with a stick or a ball. And when I go out there into the backyard and there's, there's 20 kids out there, I'm only looking for two. I'm only looking for two. I, I, I do not discipline your children. I do not discipline uh, my sister-in-law's children or my brother-in-law's children. I only care about two, and that's Emily and Daniel. I'm not going to discipline Abigail or, or any of the other um, grandchildren. I'm only going to discipline two, Emily and Daniel. Why? Because they're my kids, and I ain't messing with anybody else's kids. That's their business. That's their headache. That's their thing to do. But, but, but God disciplines us because we are truly his children. We, 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 are, we are truly his children. So when, you, so when you get to a point in life, believer, and you feel like you're experiencing the Lord's discipline in your life, say it again, Rick. Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Rejoice. Rejoice and say, man, I got a good, good father because he is looking after me, and he is taking care of me. And in my ignorance, in my rebellious ways, in my going wayward, my good, good father is disciplining me, and he's bringing me back, and he's awakening my, awakening my heart, bringing me back to himself, because we are legitimate children. Be thankful for discipline. Be thankful for the Lord's butt-whooping, for the Lord's correction, for his training, for his education, for him leading you and guiding you. It's because he wants the very best. God wants the very best for your life when it comes to following Christ, when it comes to walking in holiness, when it comes to serving him with all your heart. It's a beautiful thing to be thankful for. Let's continue. Verse 9. Verse 9 says, um, the next principle we'll see, there's, there's one in every verse, I think. 
Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? The principle in verse 9, I believe, the Lord wants us to take to heart and learn this morning is this. The Lord's discipline will cause you to grow in your faith. Do you want to grow? Do you want to grow in your faith and become strong in the faith? Thank the Lord for discipline because the dis- discipline will bring it. Discipline, um, and that, that comes from two words in this verse. It says, um, furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us. Here it is. And we respected we, we respected them, so that phrase respected them, and shall we not much rather, in the word subject, subject to the Father of the spirits. When I talk about growing in the faith in verse 9, you know, it, it, it produces a humble submission. That's what discipline does. Discipline from the Lord, it produces a humble submission where you humble yourself and you say, thank you, Lord, I submit my life to you because your discipline is the best discipline. It produces a... He uses this phrase, shall we much not much rather be subject to the Father of the Spirits, Father of Spirits and Live. That word be subject in verse 9. And then, and then the previous word, respected, you know, it produces growing in our faith, the Lord's discipline, it produces a holy reverence that causes us to love and obey our good, good. Father. Again, as I said a while ago, I want to reemphasize this again because I feel like I might need to re some of this might need to be rewired in our brain. Discipline is not punishment. Punishment, by definition, by, by, by the English, by the Miriam's uh, definition of the word, punishment means to inflict vengeance. It means retribution and is, is motivated by anger. Again, punishment inflicts vengeance, retribution, and is motivated by anger. The word discipline, on the other hand, if you look up the meaning, it is to, uh, to train, to educate, to correct, to develop character. To develop character. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference in, in the two words? And the motivation for discipline is love. Is love. The same, you know, we discipline our children because we love them. And the thought of being vengeful, anger, inflicting punishment should never be a part of the disciplinary process. It's meant to develop character. And again, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you think you're strong now. Wait till, he get, wait, till he, wait till he gets done with you. He's refining you, molding you, and making you into a devout follower of Christ. His discipline is, is, is love. His discipline causes you to grow. It's evidence that you've been born again. Romans 8.28 would include the Lord's discipline in our life. And Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God. Those who are called according to his purpose. He is a good God. And his discipline produces in us growth. Amen? Verse 10. Two more verses. Verse 10 says, For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. This one's, this is a huge verse. There's a huge truth in this verse. What do you think it might be? What is the Lord's discipline does this? It causes you and I to grow in holiness. It causes you and I to grow in holiness. First Peter chapter one verse sixteen says, "Be holy, be holy, for I am holy." Hebrews twelve fourteen says, "Pursue peace with all men and holiness." Some of your translations say and sanctification, without which so you will not see the Lord. God cares more about your holiness than your comfort. 
God cares more about your holiness and your comfort, that you are conformed to the image of him, that you grow, that you, again, grow in your hatred of sin and your love for righteousness. Holiness, some, of your, uh, some translations uh, use the word holiness. Some of your translations will use the word sanctification, but they mean the same thing, holiness, sanctification. They mean uh, godly living, godly living, growing in our hatred of sin, loving righteousness, not being conformed to this world. You know, we're not to be conformed to the standards of the world, but we're to be conformed to the standards of the word. That's what holiness is. That's what sanctification is, is that we transform our hearts and minds according to what the scripture says, according to what the word of God says. And what holiness does, it brings us to this point that I can, I can give you two words to describe it, and that is complete devotion. Complete devotion to Christ. Complete devotion to the Lord. It gets to a point where, man, I just, I hate my old sinful ways. I understand that those old sinful ways kept me in chains, kept me in darkness, and I'm running from them old sinful ways, and I'm running to my glorious Savior who's helping me to live in the light. That is what the Lord's discipline does for the believer. You know, when you come to Christ, when a person first becomes a Christian, <clears throat> you're instantly justified. In other words, you're instantly in a right relationship with the Lord. If he, if he came the very next moment, you're going up. You're going to be with him. But when you first come to the Lord, that's when sanctification begins. That's when this growing process begins. I didn't have it all together when I was a Christian. I didn't have all my theology and my doctrine and my life in order like it should be. There were areas of my life that I still struggled with sin. I still struggled with rebellion in the, in the corners and the recesses of my heart. There were times, even after I became a Christian, that I, I fell back into the carnal ways and I fell back into my flesh. God wants to use his spirit and his discipline to grow you and move you away from the deeds of darkness in the flesh and moving into his glorious light. That's what the Lord's discipline does. Did I read verse 11? No, okay, okay, okay. All right, let's, let's read verse 11. Let's read verse 11. <laughs> uh, I was going on there about verse 10. Uh, verse 11 says... All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruits of righteousness. My final principle I'll present to you this morning, number six, yeah, 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 number six, is this. The Lord's discipline can be painful. can be painful. And it can be a difficult process to experience. God in his love... God in his mercy, God in his grace will do whatever it takes to get your attention, okay? You can't run from the Lord. Guess what? He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He knows every single crack and crevice of this planet, and you can't run from his presence, and he'll do whatever it takes to get your attention. And when he gets your attention... It may, feel like, it may feel like you're being taken out to the woodshed. It, 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 may, it, may feel, it may be painful. It may be difficult. But remember this. In, in the middle of the discipline, remember this. It is for your good. It, it is for your good. Romans 8.28 says, For we know that God causes all things to work together for good. For those who love God, those are called according to to his purpose. My friend, God is training you. Okay? You're a soldier in the army. You've raised your right hand and he has enlisted you into his army 
by you accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And today, now, he is training you. He is not pampering you. He's not giving you the path of least resistance. He's sharpening you. He's leading you. He's loving you. He's pushing you. He's perfecting you. He's encouraging you. He's educating you. He's fine-tuning you. He's making you a better follower of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's all for not your glory, for his glory. It's all for his glory and his honor. It says uh, afterwards, verse 11, verse 11 starts off with, it's not joyful, but sorrowful, it's painful. And sometimes we need to experience that pain so we know not to go back because we know what that pain feels like in rebellion. And we're like, once we get delivered, set free, move forward, like, I ain't going back. I ain't going back to the old ways. I'm not making that mistake again. I didn't take the drug, I didn't take drugs to school never ever again. I did not set the woods on fire ever ever again. Now I rebelled in some other areas of my life and I blew it along the ways. I could give you more. Oh um, oh I'm, I'm not gonna go there. But put it this way. Put it this way. I, I've, 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 I've experienced it, and I experienced it well because of my rebellious ways. But God is training you. He's sharpening you. He's leading you. And he's making you a better follower of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the realm of the Lord's discipline, you know, the root word of of discipline, welcome to being a disciple. Welcome to being a disciple. I am so thankful I talked to many of you guys on the phone, by text, by messenger, by whatever other means. And I, get, I, get, I hear all these stories from you guys. And I know a lot of times y'all don't share them amongst each other. But I'm hearing all these awesome stories about our body, about the believers here in this church, and the things that they are experiencing in the Lord, the victories that, that they are experiencing because of what the Lord is doing in their life. Man, my brother Bud Wilson, he brought it Wednesday night with the versatile you know, you know, we think about the word arsenal. You know, arsenal is, is weaponry. Well, he took that word arson or arson now, arsenal, and he calls it versatile. And he gave us verses to um, memorize to help us fight. Man, I woke up next morning, man. Man, your pastor, has, your pastor goes through fights too, okay? I'm not living this holier-than-thou life on cloud nine. I, I, I wrestle with the things of the flesh. So I got it the next morning, man. Started writing out my three by five cards. First Peter 1 16, be holy, for I am holy. Hebrews 12 14, pursue peace with all men and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Man, I needed that. I, I, I needed that. And that was part of the Lord leading Bud to share with us the arsenal. And those things are helping me grow in my devotion to the Lord. Because I do not want to fall back into the old ways of life. I want to close this morning. I want to close my teaching this morning with an illustration on the importance of discipline versus no discipline. And hopefully this will help you even understand discipline a whole lot better. In January of 2009, I got home from work and Irene says, hey, David, why don't you go, hey, honey, why don't you go sign up Daniel for Dixie Youth Baseball? This was like the end of January. I say, sure, whatever, okay, I'll do that. So I go up to Lexington Dixie Youth Baseball. I walk in there, and I say, hey, I'd like to sign up. This is late registration, okay? The, the regular registration had already passed. This is late registration. I had to pay an extra $25, which I didn't like. But uh, anyway, I paid it. And the ladies that are talking, they were like, oh, gosh, we need four more coaches. We need four more coaches. And the lady just looks at me. She says, would you, would you like to coach a Dixie Youth Baseball team? Now, I ain't picked up a baseball bat or a glove and. 20 years since I was a little kid playing baseball. I said, sure, why not? Sure, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, coach, I'll, coach, a, I'll coach a baseball team. Yeah, this will be fun. This will be fun. Boy, I did not know what I got myself into. So I signed up this 2009 season to, to, to coach Coach's Pitch League at the Lexington, D.C. Uh, baseball uh, complex there in Lexington. And so I met with the boys, and 2009 to 2010 was like two different seasons. In 2009, I, I didn't take it very seriously because I, 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 I didn't know what I got myself into. 
I'm like, hey, Johnny, here, catch the ball. You know, oh, that's okay, Johnny, go pick it up. You know, go put some ice on the forehead. You'll be okay. <laughs> but anyway, but my focus in 2009 Dixie Youth Baseball, just have fun. Just have fun. Man, we'd go out to practice fair. We'd have some Cokes, some sweets, some drinks, and we'll talk a little about baseball. We'll throw a few little baseballs and, and, and nothing serious, and we were just having fun. Practice, I practice maybe two days a week, two days a week for an hour. You know, we, we got to give time for all the fun stuff afterwards, the drinks and hanging out. Um, I didn't pra- we didn't practice fundamentals. We, we didn't practice the fundamentals. I didn't push them at all. And that, that was a long season. That was a long 18-game season my first year. We got taken behind the woodshed every single game. And we got spanked. And we finished in last place. By those last two games of the season, there was no discipline on the team. There was, and it all started with me, the head coach. I'm the head coach, so you know, it, was all, it was all on me. By the end of the season, we were like, just get this pain over with. Let's get this game done. Let's get the game party done so we can be done with this. So I had a lot of soul searching after that season because, you know, normally when you coach one season, they'll ask you if you want to come back. And uh, so 2010 rolled around, and I said, you know what? I'm going to do this thing. I'm, I'm going to coach, and I'm going to learn from 2009. 2010 rolled around. Uh, they called me. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll coach team again. My wife looked at me and said, you are not a very smart individual. <laughs> and I was like, you're probably right, honey, but I'm going to go for it. 2010, the focus was to win. I, that's, all I, that's, all we care, that's all I cared about. These um, eight and, um, no, no, these are seven, eight-year-olds. This is coach's pitch. Seven, eight, all, all I want to do is, is we come in here to win. We practice four days a week for two hours straight. I would push it to you till it got so dark you couldn't see the ball no more. I, I, I pushed them hard for four days a week. And if it rained, we made it up. Boy, them parents, they were like, good, great, can't you give us a day off? No, we are here to win. We are here to play ball. We were focused on the fundamentals. I remember there was this little third baseman kid he, he, he missed the ball. I went up to him, and I said, listen, listen, listen here, Johnny. I don't care what you got to do. You stop that baseball. If you got to sacrifice your body, you stop that baseball. You do not let it get out of the infield. You know, the previous season, oh, you missed the ball. Oh, that's okay. Go get, just get it next time. That's okay. No. I sacrifice your body, get in front of that ball. You stop it. It is not to get out of the infield. I was very tough on them. We focused on the fundamentals. My first baseman, if he, if he missed a baseball, if he missed a ball, well, we had, we had a little, uh, after practice, I'd put him on first base. I'd give his dad a, a bucket of 50 baseballs. And he just sat there. I, I mean, I, I made sure that they were focused and the fundamentals were in place. I drove them very, very hard. And guess what that year happened? Guess what happened that year? We went to the championship, and we won. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. We, we won the second half championship. We lost in the championship game, but we went all the way. And let me tell you something. The attitude from that first year to the second year was like night and day because them second-year boys, man, they were tough. They were rugged, and they were ready to play, and they enjoyed winning. They enjoyed winning in the second half of that season. Why? Because the head coach got it together and implemented discipline into the team. You never, ever walk onto that baseball field. When you step out of that, when you step out of that dugout, you are to run to your position. I don't care if you're going from there to third base, you are to run. If you're going from there to right field, you are to run. There was the discipline instilled in the boys, and it changed everything. Now, do you think they enjoyed running laps after missing a ball? No, but by the end of the season, they knew how to catch a ball. They knew how to stop a baseball. And it was all because of discipline. It was all because of um, the coach's discipline that, that they did well that season, and they won. I want to bring that to you this morning. If you will submit to the Lord's discipline, 
He will make you a champion in the kingdom of God. Amen? He will make you a champion. He will make you strong, rough, and tough. And if you've experienced the Lord's discipline, man, rejoice. Rejoice and say, thank you, Lord. You know, when a Christian falls away and goes into rebellion and sin, what's bad is, is, when, he's, is, is when there's no conviction. But if God knocks on your heart, exposes your sin, causes you to repent and return, rejoice and be glad. And I hope this morning, my prayer this morning, is that, we've, um, that you have a new perspective, a new perspective on the Lord's discipline. It's not about this this butt whooping and inflicting pain, but it can be, it can be painful. It can be hard. It can be challenging and he will correct you as needed, but it's more than correction. It's training, education, and discipline, and it makes you rough and tough, just like that second year baseball team. Amen? Thank you, Lord, for discipline. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you for what we've looked at in Hebrews chapter 12 this morning, Lord. You've specifically laid it out before us in the text uh, what discipline is. And, and, and Lord, we thank you for discipline. And Lord, um, I pray, Father, that, that we'll have spiritual eyes. We'll see where our heart is. And Lord, if there be any wicked ways, that, that we will repent and that we will turn wholeheartedly to you. But Lord, if it does come to a point where we're, where we're not understanding what's taking place, Father, we, I thank you that you come after us and you discipline us so that we become better followers of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and champions for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name.